Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine. Welcome to Family Fridays with RBP. Today I'm very excited to introduce to you another member of my instrument family, the viola de more. Well, as I think I already mentioned, the violin family was invented around the 1490s or so um, in its various sizes, violin, viola, cello, and at the same time, the viola da gamba family was invented in its various sizes, bass viol, tenor viol, and the little treble viol that you play in your lap. So if anybody ever tells you that the bass viol is the ancestor of the cello, that's completely wrong. They actually derive from two different um, instrument streams. The, the viola da gamba is fretted and comes from the plucked lute kind of family, and then the, the bowed, um, um, shoulder-held family of instruments. The violins come from the Rebex and the Viols um, on into the Lyra de Braccios and so on. Anyway, um, about 150 years later, in the mid-1600s, this instrument was invented around the Germany area, uh, and it combines characteristics of both violins and viols. It has the sloped shoulders and the flat back and the edges flush with the sides and a rosette sound hole, all like the viola da gamba, but it's unfretted and played on the shoulder like a violin. Um, it's really what you might call a supplemental instrument. In other words, no one starts their music lessons on this thing, and nobody plays it exclusively in only this instrument and no others. And sadly for my daughter, it does not exist in fractional sizes. Um, now, what does a viola da more mean? Well, the vast majority of demores have a blind cupid's head as their scroll. This one is actually very unusual in that its scroll is a long-haired youth. Not sure why. One of these days I have to get around to naming him. But a blind cupid head combined with the fact that the two sets of strings are vibrating together causes people to think, well, it must be the viola d'amore, the viola of love. But on the other hand, the whole idea of resonating strings is kind of an Arabic device, and its sound holes are always in the shape of Islamic flames. And so people say, well, maybe it's the viola of the Moors. And literally nobody knows. Grove Music Dictionary, the most important resource in the English language, simply says its origins are obscure. So you can think whatever you want. Um, now, it's really, very challenging to play, at least I think so. Um, I had long wanted to play one, I'll talk more about that in a sec, but when I finally got my hands on this one and started to figure it out, um, it was very humbling because I thought, okay, I can play all this virtuoso violin repertoire, I know what I'm doing, but then it was, it took me like two months to be able to manage a simple scale in the first position because there are seven strings, and so I found that my bow was on string five, and my fingers were, were on string six, and I was totally discombobulated. The other thing is, unlike a multi-string electric violin, where you don't have to have the acoustic sound box because you're plugged into an amp, this instrument, of course, needs its wooden body. And so there's only so far you can go with the curve of the bridge, and you've got to squeeze all those strings into there. So what that means is that the angle between each consecutive pair of strings is much narrower. So I would think I was changing over one string like I would on the violin, and I would actually be hopping over two. So getting used to where all the strings are with these tiny increments was another challenge physically. And you can't bear down in the same way to have the weight of your arm pull out the tone because you're just gonna end up playing a chord. So it's actually all about bow speed to draw out the sound. So lots of different technique to learn in order to play it. And of course, the fact that it has these 14 strings means that the peg box extends forever and ever. Um, means tuning is quite the um, extravaganza, shall we say. But it also means that the instrument is simply heavy. So I actually have to plan out my practice sessions on it to do um, some of it now and some of it later throughout the day. I can't just say, okay, I need to practice 45 minutes worth of practicing. Here's a 45 minute slot, I'll just go do it. Because then I would basically kill my arm. Now, um, 
Interestingly, violas de more, of course, were invented, as I said, in the mid 1600s, which means Baroque era. And at that time, there are more than 20 different documented tuning schemes. Sometimes you would have to have different gauges of gut depending on what the tuning was. And the um, resonating strings were always in the same, uh, same key or same notes as the playing strings. But then in the late 1700s, in the classical period, um, the detuning, which was already the most popular, kind of became codified. And now you can get a set of modern strings, um, dominance, um, for those of you that are players and know what I'm talking about. Um, dominant strings um, for viola de more come in the detuning. Um, so you actually can't really play some Baroque repertoire on modern de more, um, at least not easily. And the detuning, um, of course, into the modern period, not every piece is in D anymore, um, but the detuning remains. And now sometimes people um, do interesting schemes with the resonating notes, more of a chromatic approach or whatever. But I'm gonna play for you some pieces in D today with the detuning. And what that means is you have, well, let's start at the top actually, a D string, which is one whole step below the E string of the violin. So this essentially has all the notes of the violin, then the A string, which is the same as the violin, then you've got a, a, a string in here, which is a third up and down, an F sharp or an F natural if you want to play in D minor, before you get to the next D, which is the same as the D string of the violin. So you've essentially got D and A with this F sharp in between them, and then you've got an A, which is one whole step above the G string of the violin, and then you keep on going down another D, which is a low D, the first finger on the C string of the viola, and then a low A, which is actually one third below the lowest note on the viola. So it's got quite the range. So you have to find just the right bow that works for the highest notes and the lowest notes and has the right um, combination of strength and flexibility. So that's not an easy task either. Um, gosh, let's see. Well, um, so here are the strings, as I said. And here are the resonating strings. And when I'm tuning, I put it on my lap and I pluck one and then the next and back and forth. And we've actually got three nuts because you've got the normal nut running into the normal pegs. Oh, excuse me, four nuts. And then you've got the resonating strings coming from under here going through the bridge and then underneath the fingerboard, the neck is hollow so that they can go through the neck and out the back of the peg box. So they go through the neck into nut number two, out into nut number three, and then they sit on nut number four and go up into these pegs. Um, yeah, so changing a string is quite an operation, but it's all worth it. Um, Mozart's father, Leopold Mozart, in his famous treatise on violin playing, said, the viola de more is a special kind of violin that sounds especially lovely in the stillness of the evening. And um, its tone has, is often described as sweet and silvery. But I think my favorite adjective was a student of mine a number of years ago who picked up the de more for the first time, drew the bow across the strings and said, oh, how refreshing. So I thought that was just so lovely. Um, the, the resonating strings give it acoustic reverb. I guess that's what you had to do before they invented the reverb pedal. The Hardanger fiddle from um, which was also invented around the 1600s from Norway that's used for primarily uh, traditional music, also has resonating strings. It usually only has four strings, like a violin and then the resonating strings, and it has a lot of different cross tunings. And again, nobody's totally sure if they had a common ancestor. It's not thought that either of them in directly inspired the other, but they could have perhaps both been inspired by similar ideas of predecessor instruments. Um, anyway, I'm going to quickly play for you a scale on violin and de more, so you can see the difference in tone. Uh, I don't have a viola da gamba, nor do I play it, but um, it doesn't sound like that either. It's really its own special voice. So here's um, a D major scale from A to A. <laughs> Definitely not a violin. Now this instrument might be 
somewhat obscure these days. In fact, I think I might be the only concert violinist who um, seriously plays this instrument among modern players. Um, <laughs> but back in the day, it was definitely much more mainstream. In the 1700s, in the Baroque era, the best violinists in the world played it. Um, Locatelli, the greatest violinist from Italy, who was essentially Paganini's predecessor, um, he was known as a great player of the Demore. And Johann Garrick Piesendel, the greatest violinist in Germany, was actually the violinist who inspired uh, Vivaldi to write many of his concertos for this instrument. Piesendel is famous as uh, being um, possibly the only other violinist other than Bach himself to play the unaccompanied sonatas and partitas of Bach. He's definitely known to have played three voice fugues for unaccompanied violin. Um, those could have been Bach's, or they literally could have been his own improvisations because back then people could actually do that kind of thing, kind of like organists. Um, but in any case, he was a magnificent violinist and um, actually wrote his own unaccompanied sonata just a couple of years before Bach, and, uh, Bach embarked upon his. And it's thought that perhaps that was um, an inspiration for Bach to take up the genre. I'll get more to that in a minute. But in any case, um, yeah, so not only were these great players playing it, but great composers were writing for it. Bach, Telemann, as I said, Vivaldi. Um, and interestingly, sometimes they would just really go for it for its particular sound, like the famous Viola de More solos from the Bach St. John Passion, which are sadly sometimes played on muted violin or viola. But they can be played on muted violin or viola because there's, they're just single voice melodies and um, there's nothing ergonomically that you can't do on violin or viola. It just doesn't have the right sound. Um, but other composers like Vivaldi really exploited the chordal capabilities of this instrument. And so, you know, you would have these kinds of chords that you really couldn't play on the violin. Either the violin didn't have the range or the violin didn't have the ability, even with virtuoso technique, to play that combination of notes all at the same time. Um, and that started to be more and more exploded into the classical period. Famous makers, a whole bunch of different great Italian makers made demores. In fact, I have a Galliano viola demore, which is my Baroque demore, um, which I got in um, 2010. I had gotten my um, Baroque Galliano violin in 2000 and um, no, I think it was actually 2001 and 2011. Anyway, 10 years apart, the violin in London, the viola de more in New York. Turns out that both of these Gallianos, um, their tops were made from the same tree, which is amazing. But right now I've got for you my modern de more made in the 19th century. Interestingly, um, Unlike the viola da gamba, which has remained primarily an early music instrument, the viola da more, like the violin, made the transition into the modern era. People, you know, chopped off its neck and put on new ones, put on longer fingerboards, put on modern strings. And more, even though, you know, it has a, a wonderful repertoire from the 18th century, actually more than half of its repertoire comes from the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, the revival of this instrument in the early 20th century was thanks to some great violists like Hindemith and Casadesus. But this is not a kind of a viola. In other words, it's not a kind of alto member of the violin family. It's more accurately described as a kind of a violin because it was meant to be played by violinists. Its strings are violin length. And basically, um, you know, it has viola notes, but um, it's, yeah, it's, um, there's a lot, well, gosh, there's a lot more to say about it. Um, great composers from the 20, 20th century, like Massine, Puccini, and Janacek have written for it. Lots and lots of 21st century repertoire. Um, the music is, has all kinds of weird score to tours from the earlier times, but these days it's usually transcribed to sounding pitch alternating between, um, between alto and treble clefs, and it's really a project to figure out where your fingers go for each piece, and you almost have to write in the finger numbers and the string Roman numerals, um, like it's Suzuki Book One or something, to know where to play all the notes. Um, quite a project. You literally can't sight read music on this instrument. But before I play it, I'm going to give you a taste of Pissendel and just play the first movement of his unaccompanied sonata, um, because his viola de Borne music, his brilliant um, sonata, um, needs some other players to play with you. So here's the first movement of Pissendel's sonata, 
and I actually did record this on my early album, um, Solo Baroque, and I think I might have a performance of the entire thing on YouTube if I recall correctly, but here's the first movement. was the first movement of the sonata by Johann Georg Piesendil for unaccompanied violin. And now on to the Demore music. Here are the last three movements, Andante, Minuet, and Gigue, uh, Giga, from the sonata by Milandre. <laughs>
movements by Mil Andre. Well, the Vivaldi Viola de Mori concertos, by the way, you can see a YouTube video of me playing one of them with the Hong Kong Chamber Orchestra, and I recorded the complete set. I thought it was going to be one of my more obscure albums on this obscure instrument, but it turns out that that was so far my one and only record, which was picked up by a major Hollywood soundtrack. So the Viola de Mori is taking its place in the world. Um, you don't have to watch the film to check out the, the de Mori's appearance if you watch the trailer, the All Ages trailer, um, for the movie The Favorite, the one that got all the Oscars a couple years ago. You can hear um, the de Mori um, in the, the dramatic moments. All right, so to finish off, here is a piece by Karl Stamitz, um, the brother of the more famous Stamitz. Karl Stamitz was known for his particularly fine de Moray playing, and he actually wrote a great concerto for de Moray, which is on my wish list. Um, hopefully one of these days I'll get to maybe pair it with a Mozart or Saint Georges concerto for a classical period performance with an orchestra. But meanwhile, I get to play this sonata, and here is the first movement.
means forever when you finish the last note. The first movement of Stamitz Sonata for Viola de More. Well, thanks so much for watching. I'm glad you got to meet my friend here. Next week, we're back to the normal violin, and I'll be playing a program of music that has a sense of humor. I'm sure we could all use a bit of a giggle. So see you next week.